to. So what we did is we installed this contraption here. We needed something that could be quickly removed from the barge uh, for weather. If they, are, if they need to put another barge on that side of it or spin it around, they needed to uh, kind of react very quickly to that. So it had to be deployable by a couple people and um, had to have the ability to, uh, to be easily, easily utilized. The uh, sensor that we put on here is a multi-use sonar system. And so in this scenario, we've got it at, at 400 kilohertz operating frequency, we have 0 0.9, sorry, 0 0.9 degree beams. That's on this one. Um, <coughs> the one I was on last week was up in um, your guys' neck of the woods, uh, Lake Chelan. Uh, lower Baker, and we installed that. That was a much higher resolution for deeper water, and we're down to 0 0.5 degree beams. So narrow beams result in smaller footprints. Smaller footprints on the seabed results in higher resolution, higher fidelity, if you will, with the seabed. So here we have the ability to sweep it or back by about uh, 10 degrees forward, 10 degrees back, and then we rotate, sweep it or back 10 degrees, and then rotate 10 degrees back. And with that, we get the full 360 mapping with high data density, even on the outer edge of the uh, spot we're looking at. To control the localization of the detection points, we have to have a very accurate motion sensor. So this measures the, effectively, at the end of the day, we'll get a roll value, a pitch value, a heading value, and feed it with GNSS, and then fuse out an inertial navigation solution that gives us position as well. Provide it with uh, corrections to compensate for GNSS uncertainties, and we end up with um, you know a few centimeters of, of T sleep uncertainty for depth determination. So here we have the sonar and the surface sound speed probe that's right here. This is for in steering, so it's internal process, internal uh, computations for uh, that they're <coughs> affecting the sonar only. Just above that, we have a titanium rotator. It's going to rotate around. The beauty of this, of this, uh, of this stepping rotator is that it's not rotating constantly. about <coughs> the impact of that on bathymetry and synchronizing the encoder readings. But the other thing is that we're much uh, reducing the cycle time of that rotator. So it's not going to fail after one project. It'll keep running. Um, and then just above that, which you can't see because it's down here, is the inertial motion unit. That's measuring the map motion. Okay, all these same sensors cobbled together on our carbon fiber pole map mounting system with a, a GNSS antenna parameter. Okay, that's it. It's a multi on a stick, if you will. Uh, the barge is independent, <clears throat> offsets are independent. Uh, once the system's set up, power it on, and we get going. So, what we deal with, well, what these guys deal with, this is Ryan. What well, Ryan has to deal with is very complicated software. So he's not the guy that's going to go in there and come in with the software drivers, type in the offsets, figure out the genetic variations and the offset to certain data and so, and so forth. Ryan's doing this all day long. And he's trying to do the best he can. Ryan's using intuition. The success of one of these operators isn't just some magical display in front of them, it's their intuition, because they have to go, they're working in the dark, they have no idea what they're doing. They see a spot they have to do some work in, they put their bucket over here, they do some work, they click a button saying I've been there, the, the, the little grid changes color, they move back. No knowledge of what really happened there. Not until the survey comes in. The service is uploaded, <coughs> acquired, processed, uploaded, so there's a lot of work involved. So, what we put in front of Ryan is a tablet. We took the approach of just saying, you mind if I just put this little tablet right here in front of you? Don't worry about it, just, just look at it whenever you have time. Just give us a call whenever you want. And we go back in the survey shack and carry on with training um, uh, in, in the engineers. An hour later, Ryan calls and says, hey, uh, is there any way to change this color? Like, are you using this? Yes, yeah, it's great. I know exactly what I've done. Like I dropped a rock and I can see immediately where it went to. Right, so now he knows where to put the next rock. And it goes on from there. So the display is simple. It doesn't need to be complicated. Green means work, yellow means stop, 
Red means too much. Weather dredging or placing. It's constantly updating, so you, what the operator does is he, he will grab his finger and, and um, there's a, you can't see it here, but it's, it's a green line. He'll grab his finger and then drag uh, the finger on, on, this, on this leg to show the sector that he wants to have mapped. And he hits go. The system does a full 360 revolution of scanning. It takes about maybe 60 to 90 seconds. He then gets a depth layer that shows him where he needs to continue working. He then takes the green lines and focuses it on his actual work area. And then that continues to update in real time. His bucket goes down, creates a bunch of noise. He lifts the bucket up, moves over this way. By the time he's gone back to the barge, either to pick up or drop off, depending on what he's doing. He looks back on the display and knows exactly where he needs to work next. He's seen already the effect of his, of his work. <clears throat> This is what it looks like in real-time operations. This is fast-pacing. These are a bunch of multiple surveys that are being done. You can see how much time we've been putting through here. So it's, it's been massively sped up. But these are the green lines here. And this is, he's constantly adjusting this to tell the system where to focus on. He wants the highest update rate. And as he goes down the bucket, you see a bunch of noise of red. That means uh, they're building up material here. So the, the bucket's now on top of the design, which is too much material. So that sense, uh, suddenly disappears. But over time, you see going from green, this gradual reduction of green, moving over to yellow. And what they're doing in this scenario is they're placing these six foot diameter large boulders. These are armor rock. This is going, uh, armor rock uh, that's going on top of the tunnel, right? And there's a lot of effort going into this in terms of how much material they're placing on this. This is a thickness concern. Thickness translates to weight. Weight on top of the tunnel is pretty important. We don't want to crush the tunnel. So they're they're working on a on a on a, on a uh, plan for adding this armor rock. And you can see sometimes we've got the profile of this finger. Quick quick, this is the red line here, and that'll show the profile. You see the white line, which is real time uh, depth data uh, versus what's good. And then where um, uh, where he's basically placing too much material, which is not allowed. So pretty straightforward, pretty easy. This is the bar shape. And uh, as we learned from Ryan, we got rid of the entire depth display. He just puts his finger right here, and this slides right over, and he's a full display. <coughs> this is brought to him, as he saw earlier, on a tablet. It's a, just a Galaxy tablet. You can use anything with a web browser on it. The data is coming to him over Wi-Fi that's on the barge itself from the computer back in the shack. <coughs> so an overview here real quick is uh, we've got the sensor we call the ISTX 360. <coughs> We're not trying to be cute with iPhone stuff here. This is integrated because the motion sensor is part of it and uh, so is the sound speed. It's a single cable that comes from this unit and a single cable from that unit. Uh, so it's very few cables running over deck. Uh, we can run the cables 25 meters or 50 meters, whatever's needed. Um, and then we have our computer, which is the product engineer access. And we put that into a container in the back, and uh, the superintendent or the product engineer will come in and utilize that, set it up for the operator for the day. And again, the operator has nothing more than a wireless tablet. So here's uh, an example of a product engineer at work. He loads in a design template, and then uh, they add uh, their, their station offset uh, setup. Uh, one can put in back, uh, background geotiff images uh, for referencing, and otherwise it just uses a Google Earth background image. The whole thing works on a WebGIS platform, and we even offered a full API for that so that it can be integrated with other uh, crane control systems. Uh, cable Arm, uh, Cable Arm Positioning have integrated this into their software. Um, and then so the design template gets loaded in, a scan happens, when the scan happens, uh, there's a comparison between the dredge template and what's what the actual um, bottom is, and then uh, and then we can start seeing where, uh, in this case, the person needs to dump and where they're working, how much they need to add and where, and so forth. Uh, we can't see on here, but I assure you it's on there. There's also a little red dot, so it's a boom tip position, so we know kind of where that bucket is. So these are all the different times the operator hit this button right down here, the lower right corner, uh, to record a line. 
And these are all the different scans that were done. So nothing is lost. It's constantly updating the surface with the latest information. All this data can be pulled out and processed in iSleep or Chimera or whatever software you're going to use. And then, uh, and then you can utilize that to generate your actual volume uh, calculations if you needed to. This will also give you a rudimentary volume calculation, um, but I, I wouldn't put your reports to it. Um, the quality <laughs> of the data is very good, but during the dredging, you're gonna pick up the bucket, you're gonna pick up other noise, and then that noise has to sweep by. So it does take, a, you know, for, for accurate volume calculations, you should have a survey go through the data later on. However, here's the beauty of this. Web GIS based. Okay, just like Google Earth or Google Maps, you sit there and you find the area, well, part of the world you want to zoom into. And as you zoom in, you go from this size grid, that that grid breaks up into smaller chunks and it keeps breaking into smaller chunks for each of the grids. That's exactly how this works. Meaning that the information could be pulled off this dredge and sent back to the office like that with low bandwidth. And you can create automatic reports in something like Arc ArcView, QGIS. So we have a whole process to create reports automatically from QGIS taking this information. So anybody can find out the, the, uh, the construction progress um, in a pretty quick manner. So as I was getting off the dredge, I'm feeling, well, this is great. The guys at Seward love us. The dredge uh, superintendent almost, almost in front of everybody gave Pablo a big kiss on the side of the cheek <laughs> and said to him, you are the first person that understands what we're trying to do here. You're the first person that understands the problem we're having. That's a dredge superintendent. Again, these guys are absolutely against us showing up on site with the spy equipment. I took this picture as we're, as we're feeling really great. We're getting off the dredge, and this is the last shot. You know, he's got this rock, and he swung this rock, uh, he swings this rock around and drops it off. And it was beautiful. It, just, it was just like synchronicity of, uh, of, of me being able to capture this in real time. But he's got this rock. He's using North Dredge to figure out where he's got to do the work. He's hitting that green, that green grid uh, location. And he goes, he goes down to that green grid location and he goes to drop off this expensive armor. Now this is a slope here, right? So they have to put a certain thickness of rock along the slope. And uh, down he goes to drop it off. You know, there's no timer on here, but the, the time from when he is able to kind of pick up a rock and swing back around, go down, place it at this location, and then come back up, which he's coming to right now, is about two minutes. Two minutes, 10 seconds or so. Okay, so he picks it up. You can just see that little jerk in the chain, right? So they just release the, uh, the gravel, drop the rock. He comes up. And then 1001, 1002, 1003, 1004, and then going back down again. Why? Because he saw that the rock didn't go where it was supposed to go. Now he's going back down and he tries to find it. And the first time he goes down to grab it, he didn't get it. The thing came up empty, right? As you can see right away in our judge where it went to. So now he's going back to find it and pick it up. Anyway, just to, just to say real quick, we're not gonna watch the whole thing again. Two minutes to spin around, place the rock, he comes back up, nor dredge updates, he saw the rock is no longer where it should go. He goes back down to pick it up, missed it, goes back down, grabs it again, and moves it off to the side. And it doesn't sound like a big, big deal, but imagine this happening hundreds of times a day. Imagine the compounding uh, duration of that. Imagine that now he has to find a, a surveyor to come in to update the survey area to show him where things have gone. He has to go back down again, he has to clean up his, uh, his you know, mess basically, and, um, and you know, weather issues come in and so forth. So we're talking about a significant uh, uh, efficiency gain from this. And also, you know, we heard something from the prior uh, presentations, just the enthusiasm, how important that is to have that kind of uh, that connection uh, in the field. Um, you know, that, that sense of teamwork. I and mean, this is where everybody can actually have that kind of, can come together, feel it all working, and getting the best tools available for them, and therefore enjoy their jobs more, rather than working in the dark. Thank you. Any questions?